um, hello, um, good afternoon. Um, so first of all, some words about myself. I'm Jeremias Bosch. I'm working for Basiscom since over 10 years. Um, so as a, they call me a senior developing project manager. Um, so I'm doing developing uh, since the start of Qt Quick. And, um, but nowadays also a lot of project management. Um, in the context of Qt Quick, C++, but also with IT and uh, cloud stuff. Um, some words about Basiscom. So we um, around since 2004. Um, we are located in Darmstadt and Nuremberg here in Germany. Uh, we employ like 30 people and we are part of the UX Gruppe. Um, yeah, and what we do is basically we, we provide uh, services around Qt, uh, working for our customers embedded in their teams. And uh, we basically focus on technical and uh, like industry applications and also automotive if there is need for it. Okay. Uh, why this talk? Um, so basically, what we see is that there is the tends to have slow and really cost-effective hardware in projects. But uh, on the other hand, the product management actually expects uh, the performance of an iPhone 11 um, or on the low-end device. So, and as a developer, you find yourself often in, the, in an environment which is on the one hand, you, you have these expectations. On the other hand, you have the hardware, and you have to try to somehow squeeze the expectation into the hardware. And in this talk, I actually took two projects we did over the last years uh, where we had this kind of, well, challenge. And um, I want to take a look at how we actually, actually reached uh, the target and the expectations of our customers. So the one thing uh, was a Solo X project. Um, the the IMX6 here was clocked down to 400 megahertz because uh, of terminal reasons. Uh, the thing just got too hot uh, because of other hardware that was pretty close. And if they wouldn't have clocked it down to from 800 to 400, um, it would have just burned up. Um, and sometimes in, when it's getting really hot, they clocked it even down to 200 megahertz. They underclocked the CPU by 50, well, up to 70%. Uh, we only had 512 Macs for the entire system, and uh, luckily a small display, but unfortunately was a Qt 5.6.3, which had a lot of uh, trouble when it comes to memory. Um, and on the other hand, we had a project uh, which was a dual light uh, with much more power uh, to 1.2 gigahertz uh, Cortex-A9. With a lot of RAM, uh, more more than Qt, uh, still it's outdated today, but it's much better than the, the, the 5.6.3. So coming to the KPIs and expectations of the customers we had, uh, they want to have fast boot. So I put fast in, in marks because it meant that the splash screen had to be displayed in 10 seconds or under 10 seconds. And the expectation was that the user can do something with the device in 12 seconds after he plugged in the power. Uh, in average, the CPU load, uh, we were not allowed to go over 10% um, in average. Of course, there are peak times where we can, we're allowed to peak a little bit, but there was so much going on in the system itself, like a web server and uh, crazy stuff. And um, so they needed the CPU time for other stuff. Uh, we discussed them to down to 30 frames. Uh, they act, in the beginning, we had 60. Uh, but that was not possible with all these constraints we had uh, because they wanted to have a multi-pass full screen shader component running all the time and causing the refreshing of the screen. And there were over 100 screens that we were hardly uh, put down to 70 megabytes maximum use over the course of 16 months runtime. So the, the requirement was that you plug in the system and it should run without well, without crashing uh, for 16 months. And um, we, uh, it was a complex UI. And so the, the problem here basically is that on QML, especially the older QML versions, they tend to eat more memory over the time and they, they need some memory to breathe. In, and that, that was really hard to achieve in this case. 
Uh, on the other hand, we have these dual light KPIs uh, where boot time didn't matter at all. It was okay to boot three minutes. Um, but what we had here was uh, what you see is what you get editor. Like you can well configure well the, the job the, the the machine actually behind it uh, needed to do, and the user can really put in elements, and uh, the machine will react to it. But it had to run at 60 frames. Um, you have full screen animations. You have uh, huge keyboard support for um, as Asiatic well Asian uh, languages. Uh, you have uh, dynamic styling, meaning the, the user could change the colors, everything live. Uh, you have uh, OPC UA in background, you have uh, meshing control, you have access to the cloud. Um, so there's a lot of things going on in the background that are uh, actually eating up the, the system resources for, for the HMI itself. So coming to how, how you can achieve that. Um, so boot time optimization. Well, I'm not an expert on the kernel level, but if you want to do, do something really fast, then you have to optimize your kernel towards it. Um, one thing that is pretty easy, you do not show a kernel image. Uh, so just plus screen from Ubud or something. You, you don't do that. Um, so you concentrate on, well, on the application level because that's where we step in. Uh, first of all, do show something as soon as possible, um, like an image, and only after it you you do you load uh, the rest of the application. So that's what we call uh, lazy loading at startup. Um, and the thing here is that you have to design your application towards it. So you have to build modules. You have to to allow that the the application that's actually written that you can load the, the content, the main content, apart from the logic, apart from the dialogue system. Um, because in, especially in this one project in the Solo X, uh, there were dependencies to, to a lot of drivers that needed to load um, even after the kernel was, uh, was booted and you were able to start your application. The, the system behind it took a long time to actually uh, allow you interaction with, with the rest of the world, but still, the user should have the idea that he can use it already. Um, what you get here is, I mean, that there are two worlds. The one thing is like on your phone, you turn it on and then things build up partially. That's what we achieved here. Um, on the other thing is that you start to, well, implement it in a way where you load everything and only once you loaded everything, you show it. Um, from, from the experience, from the customers of our customer is that the partial loading is more acceptable to the user um, rather than having a loading spinner that runs forever um, until, until you are done. Other thing, uh, memory management. So that's, as I said, a, a big trouble in, especially in also in older Qt versions. Um, and there are basically two concepts. The first thing is you have a static system, you load everything up. And the other concept is you dynamically load uh, your QML files or your QML content, and then you, you destroy it. Um, the first approach in uh, hard memory requirements is uh, that you only load what you need, and then you get rid of it if you don't need it anymore. That works for a certain time. But after a while, as, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, the QML engine in 5.6, they it, actually started to breathe like it took actually more memory um, over the time than it would take if you just loaded everything in the beginning and never destroyed it all. What we did here actually is we made some kind of hybrid. So we load everything, uh, what we really, really need dynamically, and then we cache it back. So we, we just keep the object, we don't destroy it. Uh, once we load it. And there is some, some timer approach in the background that actually loads another screen, another screen type uh, for uh, every 10 seconds. Um, and after two minutes or three minutes, um, the most important screens are already in the cache. And after a certain runtime, everything is just, just already there. And um, this brings, well, that moves to another thing where also a lot of dynamic loading destroying uh, is, is happening which are delegates. Um, so 
one thing you always find on those devices is the scrolling performance. Um, if you have well complex delegates in your list, it's always bad. So you don't ever reach the the 60 frames at all, and 30 maybe you do. But it is the uh, delegates are getting more complex, images, data to load. The thing is just not fast enough. Um, but here again, there's there's something we use for a couple of years now, um, which well, we pre-create those delegates. Uh, we have them in an invisible item. And um, the delegate itself in the list is well basically just an item. And we are we're reacting on the uh, component completed and on the structure um, calls. And then we reparent the actual content delegate into our visible delegate. What that means is that the heavy load is happening only once in the beginning. And then we ha only have to care about the bindings and setting the right data to, to it. And um, this way, you can display a lot more uh, delegates, a, a lot more content on, uh, on, on your screen. It's much faster. And it doesn't cause that your memory is actually, well, took away from you and you don't know what's really happening because it's somewhere deep in the, in the engine. Um, moving a bit forward here um, in the same direction, which is screen management. So on those devices, um, as, as I mentioned, we always had more than 100 screens to display, different states and different screens. Um, here, again, there are two approaches you can choose from. Uh, probably there are even more, but I just picked those two. Uh, the one thing we call a page heap. And the other thing is uh, the page stack. Page stack is something which is, well, part of the Qt components, and you, you find the wording there. And what we see is that always, if the page stack is used, it's somehow an, a hidden state machine within it. So it tends to have, like, you have pages and on top of each other, and they, well, they have some dependencies to each other. And as soon as you have a complex state system, where the where some upper screen in, in the in the thing gets invalidated that it cannot be displayed anymore. Then the, always the question is what happens with the other screens? How do we move from from there to there? Um, versus the page heap, which is cons well, basically it's two items. The one item is not visible, uh, which we call the cache, and the other item is visible. And what you do is you have in the background, somewhere in C++, uh, a state machine implemented. And you only tell the, the, the system, hey, I want to show the screen. And since there's only one screen in the visible uh, field, you, you, put a, you parent the, the other screen, the, the, the one you want to display, into it. And then you can make the transition. And the entire QML only ever displays at maximum two screens at once. And the other ones are just, just well, invisible, and you can just mix them up uh, as you like, and it's much faster. And um, well, it's more, more friendly to your memory usage if you do it that way. So I, I like that approach, obviously, a bit more. <laughs> um, coming coming to, to another topic, uh, which is shaders and graphics. So shaders on low-end devices. Um, you can think, well, shader is something for the GPU, and it never touches my CPU. Unfortunately, on the driver, uh, Vivante driver, and I'm pretty sure also the open source version, um, they tend to use the CPU too. So um, if you have a full screen shader on a Solo X, it actually took 33% of the CPU time. Um, and it's something we didn't expect uh, when we first approached that, that kind of stuff. Um, and the, listen, the, the lesson we learned from it is, first of all, you have to avoid well, complex fragment shaders on that specific kind of hardware. Uh, vertex shaders, where you only well, adjust the vertices, adjust good, but adjusting the colors, it's not that nice to your CPU. Um, one thing we found in the specific device in the climber chamber, when they actually clocked down this GPU even more, um, because of the heat in, in there, uh, the CPU time goes down. So the, the idea here is um, that the clock of the GPU is actually affecting 
the CPU time um, that's used by the by the driver. So if you clock down the uh, the, the GPU, uh, you will reduce your your frames per second, but you will significantly significantly uh, reduce the impact on your CPU too. Um, which is something which is not totally obvious if you just look at the hardware and wonder how to fix stuff. So um, if you have, have a shader and you have a, a CPU trouble, then try to clock down the GPU. Um, another thing is also about rendering. Uh, the question sh on these devices, should you use textures or should you use geometry? Um, it's not a straight answer. Um, the, the thing is that if you have clear geometry like rectangles, um, just use that. Don't use big images. Uh, you could use like one pixel images, uh, one pixel to one pixel. That's that's okay, but usually just use a rectangle and color it, and that's that's fine. If you have more complex structures like a gradient or circles or round corners on, on, on your rectangles, mm, image can be faster. Not necessarily necessarily, but Usually, it's a bit faster to, to render and to, to handle. Um, for icons, um, we tend to use one colored icons, uh, probably white, and then we color it with a shader. But very important here is that you put a shader effect source in, in between. Um, you can use the image in the shader itself, but doing that will avoid that the texture is uploaded to, to the GPU all the time. You render it, and it gives you a lot of frames per second. Um, so in the demo we have above in our booth, uh, it actually to give us 10 frames per second from the 30, just doing that on the image we put into shape. So when it comes to performance issues, uh, there's a very good uh, page on the documentation. I can just recommend it. Um, the, the most important part here is uh, the QSG visualized batches. So what it does, it, um, it shows you what the um, scene ref is actually trying to do and how it tries to optimize the rendering uh, for you. And the less colors you have there, the better. So every of these colors up here, uh, up here is basically one batch and it's, it's rendered and then the state is changed and you're, and you're open GL and then it's rendered again and again. Uh, the other ones are more or less self-explaining, so it gives you some debug information about the render and what's what's going on there, and the timing gives you some some idea of how fast it's actually rendered and how long the render uh, rendering took. Uh, and yeah, the, the other thing is um, if you have also if you have unexpected high CPU load on those devices uh, when you're rendering something, um, then you might have a batching issue. So this is just just something to keep in mind if if the CPU goes goes uh, well you have a you have a screen that does nothing and you take about eight ten percent of your CPU that's probably something about the batching that's uh, not ideal so you either have some transparencies that you don't expect um, or expect it or or stuff like that yeah some conclusion so the initial question um, we had was is it actually possible to run a modern H HMI uh, on a low-end iMix6 device? Um, the answer is basically yes, but you have to keep the limitations of your device in your mind, always. Uh, it's super important to test on hardware. We, we see it a lot that people don't test on hardware, and uh, then they, after two years, they come to the hardware and they're wondering why nothing works like on a desktop. Um, you have to, with your customer, you have to, or with, with your colleagues and whoever that is, uh, you have to define key performance indicators um, about what is acceptable performance. And you have to be very straight on it and you have to fight for it uh, to get these numbers because people always say, as good as possible. And that's not the answer, it's, it's a threat. <laughs> and um, so they, you have really to, to fight for it um, it's always hard to get a product manager to accept 30 frames per second. Um, they always want more. <laughs> and um, if you see uh, issues, um, don't wait. They will never go away. It will only get worse. And if you see rendering or performance or memory issues, just nail them down and fix them right away. Um, and on, on caching and memory, as, as is written here, 
um, make it make it really more predictable um, by by adding a cache. Uh, don't use the dynamic loading and too much. It's I, I know I, I used to use it, and, but in these devices, and if you're having a low memory um, uh, target, a lower memory target, then it's getting out of your hand if you don't do caching. And yeah, uh, don't use 5.6 and use some more recent Qt versions. <laughs> it's helping you also a lot, but yeah, in some cases you can't do have this choice. Um, yeah, we have a demo. I can also show it to you on the desktop um, from, a, from a target or that was actually developed for an IMX6 solo. Um, just, let's see. You can see it here, hopefully. So basically what we did here, uh, it was a charger um, for an electric car, or it is actually. <laughs> And uh, so you can plug in the, the car on the one side and you plug it to your, your home connector on the other side. And the challenge here is that the, the device itself, it's really compact and there is like a going up to 30, 32 amperes below it, uh, below, the uh, below the display. And that's why it's getting so hot. Um, and as you see here, the, there's, the UI isn't too complex in this case. However, if you start to connect your car, it's actually starting a shader in the background. It's always all the time running, and it's actually adjusting to um, to the state of your of your charge. And there's even some little bolts coming in and looking a bit more electric. And um, so that was really fast. And then the the customer wanted to have some some cool effects here and um, to, to do this kind of stuff. And it should always run, run fast, uh, no matter what the system state and what the system temperature is. And um, yeah, especially about this, this project, um, the, the, there was a lot of background in here. So like, uh, as I said before, a web server running, um, there was, there was uh, uh, some, Mem energy management running, so controlling other devices in this in the house, um, the, a lot of things. So the HMI didn't have any priority um, from from the CPU perspective or from the system designer perspective. But the HMI is the only thing the user sees. So it even in these in these cases, um, the thing have to be fast. So that's it. Any questions? Yeah, we just we want to ask any questions. We need you to use the microphone. So, okay. Can you share uh, any experiences about um, what the different drivers, I mean, Vivante or Etnaviv, or different versions, kernel versions of them? Uh, yeah, have on, on on the performance expectations like okay, you can't use that old stuff at all, or the new ones got worse, or <laughs> something like that. Um, not especially on the versions. So what we have in our bo uh, booth is actually an Atnaviv, uh, the open source version of the Vivante, which tend to use well, it tends to work a bit better than the official one. Uh, I also. Or we also see that the official uh, driver from uh, well, the official Vivante driver tend to take more memory, um, so it's a bit more hungry uh, on the memory side, and we guess it's also a bit leaking at some places. But I don't want, to, well, I have no proof of it. Um, for the kernel versions, I have no real experience on that one. Sorry. Uh, you said early, you mentioned earlier that um, you had some performance degradation yeah. uh, when you were allocating uh, uh, dy the memory dynamically. Yes. Uh, is that because of uh, uh, the memory fragmentation or there was uh, an issue in uh, QT? And also, 
There are some uh, uh, allocators like TLFS, for example, that they have a very low fragmentation. It's like 15% yeah. that it could be used. So the, the actual performance degradation is happening because the uh, everything happens in the main thread, right? So the first of all, if you start, uh, if you if you load something, and you don't have the compilers, and in 5.6 nothing was pre-compiled. So first of all, the first time you have to compile the QML file, and then you have to create the object from it, and this takes time. So we're talking about maybe two, 100, 200 milliseconds, but it's noticeable from the user perspective, uh, rather than zero. Uh, if it's already loaded and you just toggle the visibility. So, and for the fragmentation, um, what's actually happening, if you destroy something, it's marked as uh, to be sweeped away from the garbage collector, which doesn't mean it's happening immediately from the engine side. So, and if you just um, reload the, entire, the same thing again as an object, the uh, QML engine looks for memory, and in the memory part, it's actually has allocated. And usually, if you do it fast enough, then it doesn't find some free memory, and it allocates more memory. And in the older Qt versions, the more memory actually was like two megabytes uh, steps. And once it get once the QML engine or garbage collector actually deletes something, it never deletes everything, and then it tries to fill these gaps all the time, and um, that's that's what the this breathing is actually causing. Like um, it has then some memory allocated and can somehow put its its um, its objects into it, but yeah, in the end it takes more memory and um, the, all the allocation of the memory takes also some more time if it's uh, required to do that. I hope that answers your question. You're looking a bit... So the problem actually uh, is QT at some, uh, uh, at some extent. I don't want to call it a problem. It's just an implementation detail. You know, it's, yeah. it's how the engine actually worked, and it was was way worse below uh, before five five or five six. It was like allocating thirty two megabytes chunks. It was totally crazy, um, but that's how it works, right? So there also you find bugs in the bug tracker that QML is leaking memory, but actually isn't. It's this behavior. Okay, thanks. Yeah. As I said, you're welcome uh, to visit our booth to touch this uh, demo by yourself. And um, thank you. Thank you.